This is the key for Bayonetta 3. How are we going today, everyone? My name is Rockin. Thank you guys so much for clicking on this video. We have 50 episodes of this series, almost one year, and I cannot thank you guys enough. So without further ado, let's get right into the Son of God theory. If you do want to understand the whole video, you can watch the previous part of this episode right above here, but come back right here, you better promise me. I have a hunch that Loki's true story is a little dark, if you may say. Call me a conspiracy theorist, but since I finished the game in late 2018, there's just something about him that makes me so worried. Or maybe I just played too much Among Us. <laughs> this is the motif that I theorize that is happening throughout the Bayonetta franchise. We get shocked whenever we find out or when we complete the next sequel and we find out that the previous boss was most likely just a puppet. We end up guilty after learning what the previous game's last boss really was. Loki's name is most likely based on Loki, the Norse god of mischief. And yes, I know Lopter's name is based off Loki as well, but Lopter never introduced himself verbally like I am Lopter. Only Glamour was the only one who mentioned the name Lopter verbally and also the game itself. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll culminate all my findings and crush those into a big reveal. Now here is what I find sus. I'm gonna do some 200 IQ Among Us gameplay right now. In the scenes where Loki requires help in dire need, it's very subtle, but it's very suspicious as well. He shows the full card every time he's in dire need or when the situation gets tense. Ooh, scary. Off with their heads, eh? Supposed to negotiate from a position of strength, little one. Please take me to Fibbleventer, or the world will end. He and I, we are good and evil. Evil cannot be all that is left. What? Keep us safe with this. It's my trump card. Please, just take me there. Firstly, Loki uses it on Bayonetta for the very first time. Could he be faking that the card is not working, like a magician who has pretended to fail his magic trick? For the second time, Loki uses it again while negotiating with Bayonetta. For the third time, Loki uses it again on Luca to take him to the summoning rock. I don't know, but his act here kind of seems a little bit of what a god of mischief would do. And just to point it out there, this scene stares into the other cards, but swiftly skips over the full card, like a magician using sleight of hand and misdirection. I also find it suspicious how he calls the full card, which has the hole in the middle, as the trump card. But didn't he only have one trump card? Why is he pointing to the fool card if the nothingness card is the trump card? Or maybe the fool card is the true trump card, or maybe he has two trump cards. I'm not so sure. He's a god of mischief, probably. Let's go. But it's only at the very end that caught everyone's attention. Again, ever since I played this game and I finished it in 2018, this is the puzzle that I've wanted to solve. Is this an allegory of Bayonetta's journey through the first and second games? Or is this an end credit scene just like how Marvel teases their next movies? Or maybe it's just Loki saying, I'm alive. Let's theorize about the latter because that's what seems more interesting to me. So we have Loki's name being renowned as the god of mischief and the card being shown in times of need. Could this whole thing been an illusion by Loki? And just to point it out there, I don't think this spell, quote unquote illusion, is one that warps your reality or warps your vision. What I really believe is that this is more of a political weapon that makes you much more believable, much more trustworthy, which I think is a very dangerous weapon, especially who to believe and who to be suspicious of. If you can control that, you can control wars. What if Loki was the true evil half? Is it possible that Lopta was trying to bring balance to the world all this time, but we kept interfering with his plan? If you think about it, all Bayonetta wanted to do was just bring John back. 
nothing else. Slice of life. <laughs> Day in the life of a witch. Bayonetta's adventure could have finished right after the Inferno arc. Loki was essentially the driver of the big picture here. Lopta wanted all the power to himself by bringing back the eyes of the world or returning them to him. How he said it though, well, let's just say he wouldn't get any sharks if he pitched his idea to Shark Tank. Sure, he may have plotted the witch hunts and genocided both clans, but he is a divine being. What can you do in the Bayonetta universe if you're just a human against a god? Well, I guess you can... One hit! One hit! <laughs> One hit! Do you all remember... I still believe that there is a bigger picture to Bayonetta 2 that we have to look into. Well, well, picture this and let this point really sick in. The hunt for the eyes of the world only started when our Cereza was conceived and the Forbidden Child prophecy started. Remember, the Forbidden Child between the two clans would trigger the second Armageddon. Lopta, as he watches humanity, found out about this. Whoever or whatever the second Armageddon is, we don't know, we just have to wait for Bayonetta 3 or Bayonetta 4, if there is even going to be a Bayonetta 4. <laughs> but what we found in this theory it is possible that Lopta was trying to regain his former self to stop an impending threat, a bigger threat. This theory is extremely parallel to Giovanni's goal to get the Master Ball in red and blue, to prevent Mewtwo from going apeshit, or when Ultron in Avengers Age of Ultron was in fact preparing for Thanos' snap, and therefore being able to fight Thanos. It's just the way that they conveyed their mission. Lopta conveyed it to radically, and Loki, well, he basically just stabbed us in the back without even us knowing it. Here, to look at it simply, Lopta's goal was to reclaim the eyes of the world and have a better chance at fighting this bigger threat than if the eyes of the world were in the hands of untrained or unoriginal users. Remember, the second Armageddon is bound to happen due to the Forbidden Child prophecy, and this was Acer's way of preparing for it. While what was Loki's goal? Remember, he had amnesia and all he wanted to do was to stop Lopta, which in turn, if he did successfully stop Lopta, that would completely take out the the last strongest being who's capable of standing in the way of the bigger threat. Possibly someone who is puppeteering Loki. You get me? Loki did mistakenly say he was someone else. And I have a name, it's Aesir. I mean, my name is Loki. Maybe that's the true Aesir. If you think about it, humans are the ones that start wars. That was the whole message in the Automata. If Loki, the supposed god of mischief, wanted to Armageddon, then definitely he needed Lopta to be out of the picture. Well, if Lopta can stand a chance against this impending threat, whoever it is or whatever it is, he needs to get out of this picture. And what made me like this theory a lot is let's go back to the ending scene of Bayonetta 2, where Loki's most distinct and suspicious card just mysteriously pops out of nowhere like a mysterious act of God. Here is where it gets interesting. It's as if the illusion is activated when a hole is impaled in the head of the fool only to look at us all patched up, signifying that the illusion has been complete. The Fool. We are the fools. That card was looking at us. We may have potentially lost Earth's best chance against the impending threat of the second Armageddon. It progresses our adventure into Bayonetta 3. He essentially gave us Bayonetta 3, so yeah. Love him. Loki disappeared somewhere, but I'm pretty sure he will be back because, you know, shown in antics. But I think seeing an adult Loki would be pretty cool as well. If this theory is true, if Loki was evil, I guess we were too focused on winning the battle and not the war. Maybe he was just being a son of God. A son of the God of reality. I'm Rakan. Happy theory. <laughs>Bayonetta 3 could take a dive into who started the Umbran Witches and the Lumen Sages. Now, we do know that they did defend the eyes of the world throughout history, and there is no recollection of who the first elders were. Except for one. 
there could be a chance we get to explore the grand history of Bayonetta in Bayonetta 3. Okay, here are the confirmed pivotal characters of the Umbran Witches and the Lumen Sages. Are you ready? The ones shown are Bayonetta, John, Rosa, and Umbranelda. The ones mentioned were Tarandot, Matriona, Yaneldushi, Karaba, Cleopatra, Akko, Yaxi, Aizen, Ava, Mary, Akuni, and Angel Slayer. Another possible one is Alraun. Now you do have the Umbran trainee, but we are not worried about that at the moment. As for the Lumen Sages, the ones shown are Boulder. <laughs> the ones mentioned are Inferno Slayer and the Lumen Elder. Could have been possible that Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great were Lumen Sages in the Bayonetta universe. Maybe. Now, any more? Yes. The Umbran and Lumen Sage statue at the Crescent and Sunrise. Valley. Mr. Hideki Kamiya-san has confirmed there are female members in the clan, but females do not become Lumen Sages, though this can change if Bayonetta awakens her new power. Oh my god, so I saved that screenshot on the 26th of March 2020, way before episode 1 of the series, so it took me 50 f***ing episodes to get this screenshot out there. Anyway, the absence of Lumen Sages could spell that we get to play a Lumen Sage for a portion of the game in Bayonetta 3, exploring the ruins and remains of his Lumen heritage. Now for the sake of the video, I don't want to dive into the accessories of the Umbran Witches, but I do touch on why there are witches all over the world. You'll see. What really fascinated me was this the Crescent and Sunrise Valleys. These are the only source of the previous leaders of each clan, before the Umbran and Lumen Elders. Better yet, the first leaders, and even better, whom I think pioneered and started Umbran and Lumen Sage magic. If you've seen some of my previous videos, you know that I am a complete nerd when it comes to names and etymology. So what could these two humans' names have been? Now, I did some quick digging into Norse mythology and there are a lot of branches and factions to cover, but here are the things that I found interesting. Balder is said to be the god of light, while his twin brother, Hod, is said to be the god of darkness. Now, in the Bayonetta universe, we have Radan, we have Aesir, and we have Balder who were based on Norse mythology and appropriated into a game. I decided to name these two figures Ava and Ade respectively. It's very important that this Ava who pioneered Umbran arts is not the same Ava that created the Bracelet of Time. I speculate that the Bracelet of Time Ava was foreseen as an extraordinary witch when she was born, hence why she was named after the Ava that I am going to talk about right now. So it's a speculation within a speculation. <laughs> If you've noticed, I named them Ada and Eva, which is of course derived from Adam and Eve from Christian theology, the advent of humanity. Okay, so the following readings are now speculation, which are based on theories that we've made so far. Also, the following is slightly different to previous videos since I came up with more fun ideas. Some of the characters are also based on Christian theology. This is my Garden of Eden theory. Okay, let's get into it. The first Armageddon has subsided, and the trinity of realities are now here. Juvelius, Sheba, and Aesir are respectively reigning over their worlds after being unknowingly chosen by Lilith. Both Juvelius and Sheba do not know of Lilith. Lilith roamed the earth for millennia, coursing through the eras of humanity. She sought to bestow her power to someone worthy, since her power was slowly subsiding. Her eyes of the world were in the custody of Asir. She stumbles upon a small tribe led by a man named Ade and a woman named Ava, who believed in a celestial domain they called the Divine Will. Ava firmly places her palm on Lilith's forehead. Are you sick, little one? Ade was raised as a blacksmith that was in love with the weapons he created. His tanned body showcased his constant presence in front of a fire. Ava enjoyed alchemy and envisioned a time where telekinetic powers would be a reality. Her long, beautiful white hair, white as snow, flowed elegantly wherever the wind sang. The men and women in the group wore peasants' clothing, like a tribe. Roles for hunting, cooking, teaching were shared between the people. However, women were more servants than companions. The two had already amassed a small following of believers of the divine will known as the Restorationist. Based on the real-world belief that Christianity should be restored along the lines of what is known about the apostolic early church. The year is 500, around 1000 years prior to the witch hunts and 1500 years prior to the events of our Bayonetta. 
Not knowing their god was right in front of them, Lilith played along as one of their new followers. Are and Eva both led the Restorationists with secret doctrines believing in one god, even though they didn't realize the first Armageddon even occurred. One night, Lilith enslaved Ada's mind while he was sleeping, and during the first nightmare, Ada wakes up the next morning, breathing heavily. He dreamt about the first Armageddon, and had the epiphany of the trinity of realities. Visiting the domain of Paradiso in his dream, he sees a heavenly world as far as the eye can see. A few months pass, with Ada secretly indoctrinating his men of such a world. Ava, on the other hand, grows suspicion towards the men of Ada. Ada quickly storms into Ava's room, not knowing she was getting dressed though. Blushing, he proceeds to get a hammer thrown at his face, met with a scream that wakes the community up. Ava, I have to tell you something. After some bandages, Ada explains to Ava that he claims to have seen the world of the divine will, a beautiful, heavenly place that calms one's skin, fountains that flowed with the most distilled of waters. Ava, confused, as she saw the complete opposite, a barren wasteland of red lava and brimstone. Ada stood up in frustration, unable to channel his irritation properly, only to have his right eye glow in a blue aura. How long have you known? Ava, looking down in submission with her eyes closed, sitting down on her knees like she's not trying to make a mess of the floor. You dare defy the divine will? Ada proceeds to slap <gasps> Ava only to be avoided with Ava's instinct. Ava stands and stares into Ida's menacing eyes as her left eye glows in a bright red. The woman here will not be servants to you anymore. You are denying a lifetime of paradise. What about all the things we worked for? Ava stands her ground and unleashes a red burst of energy from her palms, decimating the shack that surrounded them. A gargantuan crater is formed as the shack disintegrates, only leaving the frame. You devil! Hara quickly picks up his clay mold from the debris and breaks the clay casing to reveal a golden blade. He coughs up blood from the immense power. A boy, hiding cautiously behind a small building, eavesdrops on the two. Hara quickly detects his energy and proceeds to hold his hand out to him. Rodan, boy, run! Ava swiftly takes out the crossbow prototype she had been working on and aims it at the boy. An engraving of William is carved into the side. The long sword makes it in time to knock the crossbow out of aim. Ava! With all his strength, Ada pins Ava's neck, pushing her away from the town as far as possible. They land on a rocky hill overlooking the horizon. The sight is beautiful. Both breathe heavily as they menacingly stare into each other's eyes. <coughs> If only I could slow down time <coughs> to kill you slowly. No such paradise should be in human hands. And a land of fire brimstone is any better? Ava readies both her hidden crossbows attached to her feet as she swiftly balances on her right hand, aiming her feet at Ade. Ade stands his ground, gritting his teeth, protecting his body with his sword. The arrow grazes his sword and just barely scratches his tricep. All that for a drop of blood. <laughs> Snake venom? Ada's heart quickly pounds intensely for a second as he coughs up blood as his vision starts to blur. Ava's beautiful white hair forms into a strong armor. A shiny silver spear-like arrow, harder than that of titanium, protrudes from the palm of her hand and raised like a javelin. While Ada presumes to stab his longsword into the ground, he cracks his knuckles into a fist as it glows a bright yellow. Ade utters in his mind. May you be the one to inherit this script to create and destroy Rodan. May my kin strive for a peaceful life. Where did these powers come from? The blue sky quickly turns into a dark, distilled black and white at the same time. A perfect solar eclipse forms above the hill as the clock strikes noon. Both chant out simultaneously with all their heart. Ava, with her left eye burning in a passionate crimson red, strives forward with her titanium javelin 
in her hand. Ade's fist, paired with a blue oceanic hue in his eye, strives forward, aiming for Ava's throat. For a split second before they connect, Lilith appears between the two. Ade strikes Lilith's throat, while Ava impales her mortal chest. Lilith shivers in pain, finally knowing what humans have endured for generations. You! She slowly falls as Ade catches her. I... I just wanted to show how beautiful the Divine Will is. What are you talking about? I've been waiting for you too. For a very, very long time. We can help you. Don't talk, little one! Lilith places her palms on each of their foreheads as the solar eclipse dissipates. If ever a child were to be born from my two kin... Little one, what is your name? <laughs> Lil the sun shines onto the right of the mountain, as the moon to the left. They both see her soul leave her body, dissipating into angelic rips of paper. Ade carries Lilith's body and honorably buries her in a hill not too far from the mountain they fought. A tombstone forms above her grave, as Ade frustratingly cries, What? What's your name? He inscribes. Friend, here is what I am reminded of. Love said the first is springtime, but the second resembles me so much. Her name is... Ava has escaped a few miles away from Ade's men. Plans to travel the world to free enslaved women of every culture, of every land. Only to return to Europe as a fulfilled warrior. She stands her ground, looks upon her followers of the moon, as to Ade with his followers of the sun. Simultaneously, they preach with passion. From, From the, the darkness, darkness, we draw our strength! The first Umbran witches, and the first Lumen sages, may your paths only cross to save humanity. Now if you realize that gravestone that Ade wrote on is the same gravestone that you see at the prologue scene of Bayonetta 1. Therefore the core players in Bayonetta 3 were there from the very start. I find that pretty cool. Now the gravestone I put into the story is a complete stretch but what I like to do is I find little bits of easter eggs that I find throughout the game that have not been explained yet and make a whole story around them because I find that a little bit more interesting. Therefore turning them into potential story arcs for future games. Anyways in Bayonetta 3 I theorized that Lilith's awakening and possession of little Cereza's body would spell the revival of the first Umbran Witch and the first Lumen Sage. Potentially, also humanity's strongest human before Bayonetta, Eggman the Destroyer. Eggman doesn't have to be the purple figure. He could be, but he doesn't have to be. It could be someone completely different and Eggman could be reintroduced in Bayonetta 3, purple figure or not. But maybe it's someone more fitting of a blood moon. A huge shout out and a big thank you to Nessa and Zach Elliott for being in this collaboration. Please go ahead and click their socials below, subscribe and follow all their accounts. I'm Rockin and the final part of episode 50 is coming. Happy theorizing. The Holy Trinity, the destroyer of worlds, or altogether, the four horsemen of the Armageddon. Bayonetta 3's purple figure. We've said it could be Eggman. Some say it's Antonio, and we've also said it could be Cheshire. But what we do know is that it's extremely likely that the narrative of the enemies in the teaser could be a recurring sleeper agent like John and Young Balder. The apocalyptic turmoil that we are going to face in Bayonetta 3 could be because we failed to see the bigger picture against a seer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
He was warning us of a threat that even he himself, with the eyes of the world, could not stop. Maybe that's true, maybe not. But could there be another magic user that has been hiding all this time? The Blood Moon in the Bayonetta 3 teaser trailer, was that hinting something else? Was Platinum Games telling us to look deeper? Or maybe even literally, li yeah, li yeah. Li literally, literally, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. An eclipse coming down for the apocalypse. Not literally a bloody moon, but maybe a person. Just to warn you guys, this is slightly different to my top seven picks video and could have potential spoilers for Bayonetta 3. You have been warned. Now, how I came to this conclusion of this secret magic user was merely through the political threat logic that I will explain through these three examples. When Itachi died in Naruto Shippuden, Pain was able to destroy Konoha. If you notice, no one really obliterated Konoha while Itachi was in the Akatsuki. When All Might lost his power, new villains started popping out. When Stark was gone, that's when all the haters started to come out out of the shadows with their technology. Now hear me out, Bayonetta 3 could finally introduce the third human magic user, an Eclipsian mage. An adapted mix of both Umbran and Lumen Arts designed to slay the Forbidden Child. I speculate that there will be another book left by Antonio or a page that has been ripped out by Antonio that really talks about who this Eclipsian mage really is. This is what the book or the ripped out page would say. Eclipsian Arts is the amalgamation of both Umbran and Lumen Arts. It is believed that an adopted human child was taught this magic. This happened somewhere in Vigrid, after the witch hunts, where a dying Lumen Sage and an Umbran witch worked together. A loophole to the forbidden child policy inscribed in the stones of both the clans of the Umbran Witches and Lumen Sages. A secret mission to slay the forbidden child. Due to fate, the Umbran Witch and the Lumen Sage named their adoptive child the Force of Bayonetta. You're not the only forbidden child. In Bayonetta 3, the Eclipsian mage named Ludovicus aims to defeat the forbidden witch Bayonetta. Why the name Ludovicus? Well, here's why. Bayonetta was coined from the term bayonet, a primary melee weapon used in World War I. Another crucial weapon from the war was the Lewis machine gun, where Lewis was derived from the post-classical Latin name Ludovicus. Also, both of them have the same amount of syllables, you know, Bayonetta and Ludovicus. Just like how Bayonetta was originally named Cereza, Ludovicus would have been named Louis when he was a child. Essentially, and this is where it gets really, really exciting, I love this part, we're going to see a fight, a recurring fight, between the Forbidden Child and whom I'd like to call the Foreordained Child. Or the Oreo Child, because, you know, there's light and dark in the cookie, so... But yeah, anyways, that recurring fight would be epic. It also fits the narrative of the sleeper agent like John and young Balder. We would finally understand who that person fully is on the third fight with them. Now, towards the last chapters of Bayonetta 3, Ludovicus and Bayonetta would have a mutual agreement to take down Lilith. A bayonet and a Lewis machine gun separated were deadly enough, but dual wielding them against the central powers of the world now that is a sight to see. Now if you look at it, it's Bayonetta and Ludovicus against the central eyes of the world. While Bayonetta would be fighting Eggman in the first initial and mid chapters, where would John and our beloved loved characters would be? John would be set to take down the first Umbran Witch Queen, Umbran Witch Ava. The first witch versus the Last Witch, where we finally get to play as John in some chapters throughout Bayonetta 3, exploring her origins and potential parents. Umbran Witch Ava would possibly have enough strong magic to put John into a genjutsu, either through time travel or even just an illusion like we see her past in some sort of VR world. Now, throughout their fight, this is what they're going to say. I'm going to put some manga inserts and I hope you enjoy. Now, how about Ade? Who is he going to fight? I would have to put him against Radan, the Infinite One. The Infinite One. Boy, you've grown so much, but far from infinite. So you've become a devil in Angel's clothing. Don't forget who taught you that fist, Broden. Could you imagine the cool, epic, shonen conversation of this fight where we finally get to play as Radon for a few chapters? The Eternal One 
versus the Infinite One. And finally, we have our last theater of war. We have Bayonetta and Ludovicus versus Lilith. And also it would be really dark, yet an epic showcase if Lilith possessed Little Cereza's grown-up body. Remember, both of them were called Little One by a motherly figure. Are you sick, Little One? Therefore, I would call this epic conclusion of a fight, a grand finale, The Forbidden Children versus The First Memories of Little Ones. Cereza, shall we illustrate? This is the second Armageddon. If only there was an anime to all of this. <laughs> I'm Rakan, and thank you so much for 50 grand episodes of Bayonetta 3 Theories. Happy theorizing. あのね、アクションゲームやるのに、そんな深く考えちゃダメ。<笑><笑>